Hello and welcome. Alrighty, so it is the top of the hour. Um, so we're going to get started. Um, my name is Quincy Sweeney and I'm the Director of Behavior and Training at the Santa Fe Animal Shelter. Welcome um, to Kitten Socializing. We'll be focusing today on foster kittens and we are very lucky to be joined by Molly DeVos. Um, so I'm just going to do a couple of housekeeping things prior to us getting started here. Um, so I think you probably noticed, right, everyone's muted. We ask that you stay muted um, as well as keeping your cameras off. We also highly recommend um, that you keep uh, the your video you can kind of watch this in a couple of different ways and we recommend um watching in speaker view rather than gallery view this ensures that you can kind of see um, the person who's talking and not everyone else um, so to switch that to uh, speaker view function you're going to go up to the right hand corner um, and shift to speaker view um, so along with that we uh, also will be, hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end to do some question and answers. Um, we'll be running that uh, based off of the chat function at the bottom of your screen. So if you wanna check that out um, down there, it says chat and you can type something in, then I'll see it. Um, and then hopefully at the end, we'll have time and we can go through and answer some of your questions. Um, yeah, alrighty, so hopefully that helps. Uh, making sure everyone's having a good time and a, a smooth Zoom meeting. Um, yeah, so no further ado, I would love to introduce Molly DeVos. Um, we are extremely excited to have her. Um, she is a certified feline training and behavior specialist, um, a certified cat behavior consultant, founder of Cat Behavior Solutions and host of Cat Talk Radio. Um, so along with all of this extraordinary work that she does um, with uh, pet guardians in the community, she also works with a number of shelters. Um, and we are super excited that we get to be one of those shelters that she um, helps out with. Um, yeah, so. So we benefit from her so much, we decided it would be great to kind of share all that she knows, not all, but some of what she knows, specifically with kitten season. Um, you know, socializing kittens, it's a huge task and we really rely on all of our fosters um, and I know shelters around the country do as well. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it. Molly, you wanna take it away? Oh, I think you're still muted. Yes, I was. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you for fostering or maybe thinking about fostering. It's a, a huge thing that you're doing. It's very important. You are laying the foundation for how these cats are going to behave as adult cats and potentially keeping them out of shelters later on in their life. And shelter euthanasia, sadly, is still the number one cause of death in cats. So as long as that's the case, then we're going to be here helping you. So let's get started. Um, let me tell you what we're going to talk about while I get us up and running here. We're going to talk about your role as fosters. We're going to talk about the three phases of fostering hissy spitty kitties. And we're gonna talk about environments, how to set up a great environment that promotes good behavior. And then we'll have time left for questions, I'm sure. So let's get started, let's jump in here. First of all, as Quincy said, I'm a certified feline training and behavior specialist um, in several ways. I'm also fear-free certified and I'm a certified Reiki master, which I find that energy work comes in very handy when I'm dealing with fear in kittens. I started Cat Behavior Solutions, which is a nonprofit dedicated to shelter diversion. I like to get to people before they're surrendering their cats so that we can keep them out of shelters. And then I also work with shelters like the Santa Fe Shelter and Dallas and others and provide 
cat behavior training and enrichment programs and things like this. And I'm also host of Cat Talk Radio, and you can find us at cattalkradio.com and that podcast on most anywhere podcasts are, iTunes, Spotify, that kind of thing. So first of all, your big role as a foster is teaching manners to these crazy kittens. So think of yourselves as the Emily Post of kittenhood, right? Our whole goal is to teach them things that are going to keep them safe and healthy and in good social standing. And remember, kittens are going to be kittens, though. We've got to keep what we do very realistic. We're never going to change the fact that they're super hyper and that they're curious and that they love to explore and that sometimes they're a little unsocial. So let's talk about normal kitten behaviors. What, what can we expect out of these little guys? Well, pouncing, biting, climbing, scratching, and our favorite, of course, everyone's favorite, the butt wiggles. And kittens really have a surge of energy and they are so instinctive in their wanting to hunt. You know, our little guys have a 96% DNA link to their wildcat ancestors, our house cats do. So a lot of what those cats need and do in the wild, our kittens and cats need at home. And it's important that we remember that and that we cultivate those instincts because if we try to put a lid on those instincts, it makes for an unhappy cat, which will eventually result in some behavioral issues. So pouncing is a natural behavior for kittens, but we sure don't want them pouncing on our feet. And biting is natural, but we don't want them biting our hands. And of course, climbing is very cool, but we don't want them climbing our legs like a tree trunk. They need to practice these behaviors with an appropriate target. So let's talk about how we do that. How do we redirect that pounce and kill? We don't use your hands ever to taunt and play. Right? Don't do the finger wiggles under the towel or run the finger along the table and get them. Don't, don't entice that. Hands are for loving and feeding and caring. They're never toys. Do use plush toys, wand toys, crinkle balls, tunnels, those kinds of things. Don't expect the kitten or cat to play on their own all the time. You need to actively pray play with kittens multiple times a day. And you do that with wand toys, crinkle balls, and, and the wand toy skill is very important. You know, you can't just slap it in their face. And especially if we're dealing with a very scared kitten, it's important to make it disappear and go around corners and fly up like a bird and get them very interested. So practice your prey play skills as well and be very patient with them. Don't tease the kitten by playing keep away. My husband is the worst at this. <laughs> He'll prey play and, and do his part, but he thinks it's a game where we got to keep it away from the kitten. And it's not. We need to allow them to catch it, kick it, and most importantly, deliver that kill bite. Because in delivering that kill bite, it releases a boost of serotonin in a cat's brain. And serotonin is what controls mood and sleep cycle. They've done some postmortem studies on overly aggressive cats and found that they actually suffer from a serotonin deficiency. And it's really hard for cats to make serotonin from their diet. So giving them this extra opportunity to get some serotonin is very important. Don't pray play without giving them the fruits of their kill, which means reward them with a treat or a meal. So the best thing you can do is pray play right before a meal and then go into your feeding schedule. Don't ever strike a kitten, obviously ever. Spray with water, yell at them, hiss at them if they play too rough. I know a lot of people think that you know, well, if we're, especially if we're, if we're fostering a solo kitten, we know that they rely on their mom and siblings to teach them when enough is enough. And we go, well, mom hisses at them, so I'm going to hiss at them. Well, we're already dealing with a cat that's incredibly fearful of you. So all that's going to do is make them more afraid of you because you're not fooling them. You're not a cat. And so I, I really don't subscribe to that. Redirect those aggressive behaviors towards an appropriate object. 
And if you can't find an appropriate object, get out of the way or out of reach. I have to deal with that with my cat, Pico. He's still a, a kitten. He's hit about five months now and he's in this teenage and he gets very rambunctious and he'll come flying out and grab my legs and full claws on. And when he's real riled up, I've got to remove myself from the environment if I can't get to a wand toy to redirect it. So you need to be responsible for your part in that. So buddies, let's talk about how do we, do we foster solo or do we foster in pairs? Now I think it's really beneficial if you can foster in pairs or more than two, because it's one of the most important ways to support their behavioral development. Now, a lot of shelters won't allow cross, you know, if you have a solo kitten, they won't allow you to pair it with another solo kitten because of disease. So just be sure to check with your shelter and see if that's possible. But if you can, get two if you're gonna foster. Because kittens learn through observation. They learn through watching other kittens. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to get someone about the same size so that they can appropriately play with one another. It helps them from feeling frustrated because when they're so scared in their environment and they're the only kitten, it's hard for them. And so having another buddy that they can relate to, one of their own species, helps them from getting quite so bored and frustrated. And of course, idle paws, you know what they say about idle paws, and they will get very destructive if they're not allowed to occupy those idle paws constructively. So let's talk about the hissy spitty kittens. Don't you love this little dude? Isn't he adorable? <laughs> and there's nothing more satisfying personally as getting one of these little guys like this who's just popping at you and hissing and maybe striking and watching them transform through the love that you provide them. It's, it's an amazing feeling. So why does a kitten have feral behavior? There's several reasons. There's a developmental period, which is from three to seven weeks, is called a kitten's sensitive developmental period. What a kitten is not exposed to during that period, they will be afraid of later in life. So it, you can assume that they haven't had any exposure to humans, obviously. Then there's also genetic remembering. I, I absolutely believe this is very strong in cats. I've fostered unsocial kittens that are from litters of multi-generational feral cats, and I've fostered unsocial kittens that are just a generation away. And there is a difference. And if you're an experienced foster, you've seen that too. That I think that the longer family tree of feral colony cats that you have, the more difficult it is. I shouldn't say more difficult, maybe slightly more challenging, but the longer the process is. The process really doesn't change anywhere on that spectrum, but it does take longer to get those guys social than it does one that's closer to a socialized family tree. So kittens, like we said, they have this defense mechanism that is just encoded in their DNA that protects them from danger. And it's very important and very strong in a cat. And so that's why they're acting the way that they're acting. And of course, they don't have positive experience with humans. But I don't like to use the F word when describing kittens. They're not all just friendly or feral. Socialization is a spectrum. So let's look at that spectrum. On the left-hand side, we have unsocialized behaviors and there are socialized counterpart behaviors. So growling or silence. A lot of times we, we misread silence as, as acceptance and it's not always because frozen in fear is a very real thing with these little guys. We're a giant thing coming at them. And oftentimes they will be very frozen. That's the case with my current foster, Leo, um, was a frozen in fear kitten. Whereas a socialized kitten, you're gonna hear much more vocalization. You'll hear meowing and trilling and purring and those kinds of things. So obviously the hiss, the pop, the swat, the lunge, when you start to go in to see them, Whereas a social kitten is gonna be very relaxed when you approach them. Their bodies will be tense, recoiled, or cowering. 
my foster Leo right now, I pick him up and he curls into a little ball like a roly poly and every muscle in his body is tense. He's like, it's like he's just hard as a rock in, in a ball till I set him down. Whereas obviously a social kitten is gonna be more like my Pico kitten where I pick him up and he's like a wet noodle and he just drapes everywhere. A tail wrapped tight against the body versus a upright tail. And you can see these visuals. I've I found you some visuals up at the top of the screen of what unsocial is looking like on the left and what social looks like on the right. We see a lot of pilo erection, where it's where the kitten will get all poofed out and their hairs will stand on end. We see ears flat, plastered flat back against their head versus upright and curious and listening to everything around them. Pupils dilated versus pupils being normal. And I have a very good example of that for you right now. This is a little girl that is, I think just left our, the Santa Fe shelter um, into foster, cute little thing. And here I was trying to gauge what we were dealing with and how she was gonna react to touch. She scampered out of her hide box, ran away from me and wedged herself into this corner between her litter box and the hide box. And I want you to watch her pupils as I start to touch her head and face. So of course I'm getting a hiss. I have a little bit of whale eye, which is the white that shows in the corner of the eye. That indicates stress. You can see the pupils are dilated, but watch them go down. When I touch the top of the head, she's like, oh, that kind of, that might actually feel good. Hmm. And then of course I go away and they dilate again and I've got that, you know, oh my God, what was that kind of look? She's too cute too. So <laughs> let's talk about the windows of socialization here. We already talked about the three to seven weeks, which is the sensitive development stage where really you want to get as much exposure to sound and handling and those kinds of things as possible in that time period. Four to five weeks is a sweet spot in there because the kittens are at the weaning stage and they're much more open to change in that window. Eight weeks, the window for socialization starts to close and at 12 weeks, it may be entirely shut. You know, once a kitten is fully weaned, they are no longer predisposed to accept change like they do at that four to five week age. I'm not saying it's impossible. It's never impossible to tame or socialize an unsocial cat. It just takes a lot longer and it's a lot harder and requires a lot more work the older they get. So we really want to try to intercept them there in that four to five week where they're not you know, they're not bottle babies and they're not at that window closing stage. So let's start by talking about the environment before we get on to the three phases. I have three phases of when a cat, a foster kitten enters your home. Phase one is letting them settle into their environment and learning how to feed them properly that will promote socialization. Phase two is where we start comforting and touching them. And phase three is where we actually start the prey play and holding them. And how fast we move through those phases depends on a lot of things. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts to that. Obviously, the level of unsocialization we're dealing with in the kitten, the environment we're putting them in, how you're interacting with them, lots of different things. So a good environment setup is a foundation for this process. So you want to start with setting this foster kitten up in an enclosed space, like a playpen or a crate. Because if you let them out in a room, a, a larger room like an office or a spare bedroom, you may not see them again. And when you do try to get to this holding phase, you may not be able to catch them. You'll be chasing them all over the room, which just terrifies them. I made the mistake of doing that with five unsocialized kittens that I was fostering for a short period of time. It was getting ready to go on transport. And I made the mistake of letting them out in my kitten foster room, which isn't huge. It's, it's about 10 by 12, but I should have left them in, the, in my wire crate because then when I wanted to start handling them, they would just be like pew, pew, pew. They were just scattering and running everywhere. And then when I finally did get my hands on them, it was like holding a buzzsaw 
So it's really important to keep them in a confined space to begin with during this process. You can let them out eventually, but not until phase four. Put this crate in an active area so they get used to seeing everybody walk around and noises and sounds of humans, and they learn that you know we're not going to kill them after all. Elevate it off the ground because kittens are much more comfortable in high vantage points. Provide a good hideaway in there for them, but not too good. You don't want to make it where you know they are so hidden that you can't get them out. I know in one of our meet and greet rooms, we have a, a, not in Santa Fe, but in the Dallas meet and greet room, we have a kitty condo that has a, a little hole in it, a little cubby in there. And when we get cats that are very scared and shy and we put them in there for a meet and greet, they go right into that cubby and getting them out is near impossible. And it's really hard on a real busy day and you got people lined up wanting to meet other cats and you're trying to tug this cat out. So make it easy on yourself. And before we, let me go back to this for a second. So I put a picture here of a, a bathroom set up, which is okay. You can use a small bathroom. It's not the most active area. I mean, obviously when you go in and go to the bathroom, it's active, but it's not as active of an area. It's not ideal. You'll want to set something up in a, in a more active space in your home. And you can see this other picture where they've built it almost looks like a little chicken coop thing in their living room, which is a, an excellent little foster place they have going. So I wanna show you my foster's environment, this Leo's. This is what I have set up. I have this folding den and I have it elevated up off the floor on a storage uh, unit. It's on wheels so I can easily drag it in and out of my garage when I do this. In it, I've got a litter box and some food and thankfully I'm fostering a, a frozen in fear cat so he doesn't jump out when I unscreen it unzip it and take pictures like this <laughs> and I have this sitting right next to my desk so he sees me working all day long he hears me on the phone he hears me you know moving around he gets lots of activity watching me come and go and it gives me an opportunity for my pico to meet him in a safe way. So I give Pico some time. I don't let him have free access to him all the time, but when I'm sitting there, I let them smell each other through the screen. They kind of paw at each other and play. And it gives them a chance to just understand that there's another cat in the house without doing a, a real full on face to face introduction because you want to do that later. But he does need to get also a sense of the other animals moving in the house. If you have dogs, if you have kids, putting them in an active area is a good thing. And because he's elevated up off the ground, those things can't actually get to him. So these, we're gonna start into phase one now through this process. Phase one, settling in and feeding, now that we've got the environment set up. This actually just happens to be Leo in the shelter. Um, this was before I took him, well, before he went on bike quarantine, and then I subsequently took him home to foster. So what you want to do is first give them an opportunity to just observe their new environment. Just, you know, don't throw food at them right away. Get them in their, in their little crate and just give them a chance to kind of decompress and, and calm down a bit. And this is a matter of hours, right? Don't free feed right? Stop the dry food, just feed canned food to your foster kitten. We'll talk about dry food later. There is a role for it with a foster kitten, just not on meal time. So you want to feed them on a routine schedule multiple times a day. So it's very important to cats. Cats have 10 essential needs and one of them is routine. It's very important. They are addicted to routine. You will have a much more social cat and kitten if you feed at the exact same time of day. Now I feed six times a day if they're very young, four times a day at about this age. This Leo is probably about four months old at this point. You want to put the food in their space and then zip it back up or close the door, 
move about three feet away because often these guys are way too scared to eat in front of you. And, and we want to get them comfortable to that spot. But at first, they're probably just going to be hunkered down in the corner, wide eyed going, oh my God, she's going to kill me. And they're not going to eat in front of you. So put the food down and then back off. Back off about three feet, stand there, wait till they come out and are comfortable eating. And then you want to move a little closer with each meal. So the next time you feed them, move two and a half feet away, and then two feet, and then one and a half, and then be standing right there as they're eating. You are, at this point, we're doing gradual desensitization. So we're gradually desensitizing them to your presence by pairing your scary presence with something wonderful, which is a meal. Then as they are eating with you standing right at the kennel, as you put the food in and they're no longer running away from you, linger a little longer, hold the dish until they're eating with your hand near it, like you see Leo doing in this picture. Now, how long you stay at phase one is going to depend on your kitten. You know, you might get through that in one day. One day, you might get a kitten that's just so scared, hissing, spitting, but by the third feeding, they're eating out of the plate right in your hand. Don't move to phase two until you have completed phase one. You want to make sure that the kitten is comfortable eating in front of you, if not off the plate that you're holding. So once you get to phase two, we're gonna start comforting and touching. So you wanna to talk to them a lot. Obviously in, a, in a, you know, a nice soft voice, high pitched, use your little baby talk voice with them. Read books out loud, take phone calls. Like I said, I have mine, my foster kitten next to my computer so that he hears me a lot and he gets used to my voice and the voices around. When you have to leave the room, leave a TV on or radio. I have the iCalm cat player and I leave that on for him. Or I'll switch it up and I'll put on Pandora. There's music for cats on Pandora. There's a YouTube channel, just tune into that on your smart TV. It's called TV for Cats that has um, hamsters and gerbils and birds and things like that. This is the phase where we're gonna start using food paired with socialization time. So what that looks like is you wanna give them a super yummy treat, not just their regular cat food necessarily, but something super yummy on a spoon or on a popsicle stick or something like that and get them comfortable now with taking that from something that you have in your hand. So they're eating off a spoon or a popsicle stick that you're holding. And then you wanna go ahead and put that super yummy treat on your finger and let them lick it off of your finger. But don't encourage biting. I mean, obviously if you have one, a kitten that's you know just biting the spoon and, and voraciously hungry, don't put your finger in there because we don't want to teach them that biting fingers is okay. But what we're doing is we're teaching them finger means something really good. Lure them towards you. So once, once you've got them now eating off a spoon, pull that or your finger, pull it a little farther towards you so that they start moving towards you. We want them to know that there's something positively associated with moving towards you the scary thing. And then add a gentle touch to that routine by either stroking the top of their head or the side of their face or under their chin. And you're going to have to get very dexterous with that because you're going to want to, you know, if you're feeding with one finger, you want to take another finger and scratch under the chin while they're licking your finger. If you're feeding with a spoon, same thing. You're going to want to try to, you know, stroke the top of the head while you're holding the spoon. And I'm going to show you well, and then, and then start touching them, um, you know, down their back, see if you can get an elevator butt, see how comfortable they are touching. Watch very carefully at this stage, because if they whip their heads around as you're going down their back, they're not comfortable with you going there yet. So stay in that collar up zone until they're comfortable with you touching the rest of their body. And when they are, start practicing placing 
two hands on either side of them so that they get used to that feel when you go to pick them up later. Do not pick them up during phase one or phase two. That comes later. Now I want to show you this little cute little torty, dilute torty here is called Eleanor, Ellie, and uh, she is also in the Santa Fe shelter and was uh, some uh, kitten that our behavior team was working with. And I want to show you what this looks like through the entire process. So Ellie sits in the corner under her caranda bed that has a towel draped in the front. And as soon as I lift the towel and put it back on the caranda bed, she starts hissing and hissing and spitting and recoiling and just pressing herself up as tightly as she can possibly be into that corner, avoiding eye contact, ears flat, tail wrapped, body tense. So then in this, I've already done spoon to finger with her. So I'm offering a treat on my finger. You can see the ears are beginning to come up. And then as she gets more comfortable with taking the treats from my finger, now she's looking up at me and giving me eye contact, which tells me that she's much more comfortable. Look at the difference in eye dilation, pupil dilation from the first picture to just this third one. The ears are coming up even more. You can see she's relaxing. Now I pull my finger forward so that her head now has to come forward. I want her to come out of that corner voluntarily. I don't wanna reach scary hands in after her and make her feel uncomfortable. Then I wanna start petting. So now I'm starting to scratch her on her chin and around her face and then more treats. And then I'm gonna move my hand down her body and I'm watching her behavior, her posture the entire time. I'm watching for the eyes to dilate. I'm watching for the ears to go down, her to start recoiling. Because at any point that I hit a threshold of uncomfort, I want to pull back. I don't want to make her uncomfortable. And that's a fine line. You know, we want to stay this side of threshold. We don't want to push them to be hissing or recoiling. But at the same time, we do need to challenge them a little each session that you have with them. And you're gonna be doing these sessions multiple times a day. And this is why it's so important to have these kittens in foster homes because shelters don't have the resources available to do this with cats five, six times a day like it needs to be done. It needs to be done in a home setting where you can build upon this five or six times a day, seven days a week. I wanna talk about super yummy treats for just a second. Because as I said, it's not always great to just use their normal wet cat food. You can if they don't like anything else, but you want the time that they're with you and you're doing these, these techniques to be really special. So we try to go with the highest value treat we can find. And you're gonna have to figure out what that is with your kitten. It's different for every kitten. In the shelters, we really like to use these squeeze tube treats. I find that Vitacraft's Lick and Lap is the most palatable than anything we've ever tried. It, most all squeeze tube treats, this is like, I don't know what they put in there, but it's like kitty crack in a tube. I mean, it is amazing. Most cats love it. And it's easy for us to use because we can either tear it open, put a little in a cup so that we're not cross-contaminating between different sets of kittens. Or if we've got an older kitten or cat, they can have a whole tube to themselves. You can use um, shaved turkey from the deli. I like to use that a lot. Baby food use chicken, beef, turkey, baby food in broth, not in gravy. That's very important. You can use tuna. You can use canned chicken. I like to keep them natural foods rather than the, the hard treats. But finding that high value treat is very important part of this process because if it's just a meh treat, well then that's kind of how they're gonna feel about you. You got to understand that what you offer here is going to be a reflection of how much you are valued. 
So I want to show you a series of videos here of another kitten that we worked with in the Santa Fe shelter this year. Uh, this little girl was um, always found hiding like this, um, pressed herself in a corner, as you can see, tightly wrapped, ears back, hissing. So this is the first time, one of the first times we were working with her, and I was trying to discover her high value trait. I wanted to see if she would respond to the lick and lap. So I'll let you watch here what we were dealing with. So I don't know if you can hear it in the background. I have the iCom cat playing. I'm talking to her. And I'm seeing, oh yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And I'm seeing how far can I get her to lean forward. And you can see I, I couldn't get her to come any farther forward than that. That was it. That was the threshold. Ears stay down, eyes stay dilated, you know, but I felt like we had found a successful high value treat. This is about two weeks later, same kitten, two weeks after the first video. Now you'll make this progress a whole lot faster because again, you're doing this five or six times a day, whereas we're just doing this once a day at best, sometimes once a day, three days a week. So it isn't probably going to take you two weeks to get here. It'll probably take you more like four days or less. You can hear her purring. She started to, to give me a little chirp trill. I pet and now I'm rewarding her good behavior with, of course, lick and lap because she's a lick and lap fan as most cats, most cats are. And then I go back in and I'm just petting her on her head. Again, collar up. And then this is her about let's say about a week after that last video you just saw. And I've just walked into the room. And this is a kitten that came from a, a, a known colony, I believe, a, a feral colony. So we know that she had lots of uh, genetic remembering of, of not socialization with people and um, this is what you can expect as far as turning around. So I wanted you to notice too that all of phase one, all of phase two is done in the kennel or in the crate that you're keeping them in. You have not picked them up, you've not held them yet, we're slowly earning our trust with these guys. So in phase three, this is where we start playing and holding with them. So what you first want to do before you pick them up is you want to introduce prey play with a wand toy. So they're going to feel much more comfortable a safe distance away from you. So a long wand toy is best. And not all cats like the same prey on the bottom. Some like mice, some like feathers. You'll have to figure out what your kitten's responding to. And it's at this stage that they're going to realize that they can start to move freely around the kennel, the, the crate, the container that they're in, without a lot of fear. You want to do prey play three to four times a day. And you wanna time this carefully because we've got to stay in that natural rhythm of hunt, catch, kill, eat, groom, sleep, right? So this is the hunt part of that, the hunt, catch, kill part. And we wanna do it right before a meal time because that rolls into the eat and then grooming and then sleep. And the more that we can facilitate that natural rhythm of kittens, the more comfortable they're gonna be in our presence. So then, Pick the kitten up with a towel and Pareto wrap it. And I'm sure all of you know what a Pareto wrap is, but if you don't, it's just, we call it a burrito because it's like wrapping a kitten with a tortilla to make a burrito. So we pick up the kitten 
I usually drape the towel on top of the kitten. I fold the towel up under its butt and up the front and then wrap each sides of the towel around so that I've got them securely in the towel. They can't scratch me because their feet are tucked in there. It also acts a bit like a thunder shirt for cats. It gives them a place to kind of duck and hide when they get scared or something. So you want to burrito wrap them and now move them to your lap and continue with phase two, which is the petting, touching, you know, all of that combined with the lick and lap or super high value treat. And then as they become more relaxed in your lap, it might be the first session, it might be the fifth session, it's gonna depend on your kitten. Go ahead and ease that towel open, the Pareto. Let the Pareto open a little bit so that the cat has a little bit of freedom to now sit and be comfortable and relaxed in your lap. It gives them choice. And choice is one of the 10 essential needs of cats. Without it, they go crazy. They've got to have choice. So now we're saying, I'm gonna give you the choice to be in my lap. Now, of course, you wanna keep an arm around them, hand on them, because you're not really giving them choice. You're not gonna let them jump down and run around at this point and run away from you. You're gonna keep them in their lap, but you're giving them the feeling of choice. And again, that's a slow thing to get into, depending on how comfortable they are. At this point, you really want to limit the number of people that are picking them up and interacting with them until they start getting a little more relaxed and open. And then as they do, as you're seeing that socialization improve, that's the time you really want to invite friends and other family members to burrito wrap them and put them on their lap and feed them and pray play with them because they need to learn that all humans are safe, not just humans that look and sound like you. And that's a very, very important step to this. So phase four, you, you've gone through all that. The kitten is now running up to the kennel as you come in the room. They're actively coming up to you, purring, socializing. Now you can let them out in a little bit bigger space. So let them out in your office or let them out in a, in a room. And now we need to set up that environment with enrichment. So again, we've got to do everything we provide them to facilitate this natural rhythm of hunt, catch, kill, eat, groom, sleep, right? So we need to provide the routine that makes that happen. So we're, we're playing with the wand toy and then we're rewarding with food, either in a meal or, or with the treats. You want them to feel safe enough to then go to the groom sleep mode. Because if they're not, if they're still scared and they're stressed out, they're not gonna be comfortable grooming and sleeping and that will cause a lot of stress. Hide treats for them to hunt. Now here's where your dry food comes in. I have the um, Slim Cat exercise ball, which is a, a ball, plastic ball. It, we sell it on our website at catbehaviorsolutions.org. And I put a little bit of dry food in there and I leave it for them at night, and I leave it for them between meals so that they have something to forage for. Foraging is very, very important for them to be able to do. Build forts and tunnels out of cardboard boxes. Play videos of fish swimming and birds flying. Again, uh, YouTube has great cat TVs for all of that. And catify the kitten space. If we don't provide appropriate space for enrichment, they're gonna make enrichment out of what they have. And that's true of adult cats as well. And that could look like destroying your furniture or climbing your leg. Because if I don't provide them something to climb vertical spaces, they're gonna climb up me and things I probably don't want them climbing up. So, you know, instead of losing them under the couch, Give them their own hidey den to be in so that they have an appropriate space to hide in. Focus on the positive rather than the negative. So it's better to give than it is to take away from them. So give them a den. Don't take them away from under the couch. So huts, dens, hideaways, hammocks, and lounges, 
vertical and horizontal scratching posts and pads, very important to provide both. Window perches like this is, is good enrichment. Tunnels and tubes. And if you're fostering, just be real mindful of using enrichment items that can be sanitized or discarded between litters. Just, you know, especially, you know, we never know what we're gonna get, obviously, when we're fostering. So we need to make sure that we're using things that, that can be reused as well. Now, if you're in the local Santa Fe area, I want to invite you to foster for us if you're not already. We have a bunch of adorable little guys. These are guys we're currently working with. The behavior team is working with, and uh, we would love to have some behavior fosters for them to go to and uh, various obviously ages and sizes. This little orange trio is just too cute. And we would love to have you um, foster any of these people and I'm more than happy to help you through that process if you do. So I think that wraps that about up. So we will open us up for questions here. And I think Quincy, I'm gonna turn this back over to Quincy to yeah. meet us with those. Great. Well, thank you, Molly. Um, so much great information there. It's, it's, it's great. Um, yeah, so uh, we did have a great question from John. Um, they asked, uh, phase one, how would that look if you were working with a bottle feeder kitten? Uh, well, good question. So yeah. that is a very, very good question. So phase one and bottle feeding, because they're not eating on their own, you're not really doing phase one. If you have a bottle kitten, it's maybe hissing at you and spitting at you as you're as it's smelling you coming at them to feed, but they will very quickly learn to associate you with the meal and the food. And so you're kind of combining things. It's hard to bottle feed a kitten, you know, and, and not hold it. I mean, obviously there's lots of bottle feeding, don't feed them on their back, that kind of thing. Just set them upright and let them take the bottle from you. And you can stroke them in the same way that we talked about, along the side of the face, top of the head, under the chin, while you're bottle feeding them. It's, it's great to start young. It's, it's wonderful to start young. Solo bottle babies are difficult because they don't have siblings and a mom to teach them bite inhibition. So that, that does pose another challenge. So if you're bottle feeding, I hope you're bottle feeding two or more so that they can learn from one another through that process. Good question. Yeah, I thought it was a really good one. All right, so from Jill, um, is there any way to make a kitten more of a lap cat? Kitten more, well, this whole process makes them a lap cat because when they're in your lap and they're getting their licking lap or their turkey or their super high value treat, whatever that is, and you're petting them and touching them and holding them, they are learning that lap is a really good place to be. Lap is awesome. I get great stuff in a lap. So this whole process teaches them to do that. Now, if you have an adult cat and you're asking, how do I get my adult cat that doesn't like to sit on my lap to sit on my lap? Well, that's a different process and we'll do another one of these for adult cats soon, I hope. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hope so too. And yeah, it really is all about making that lap the, a good place to be. So yeah. All righty. Uh, all right. So that's it for the questions currently. Does anyone else have anything um, they'd like to ask Molly or about fostering? Oh, here we go. Um, how do, from Kathy, how do you discourage biting and is gentle biting okay? I don't think any kind of biting is, is okay because as a kitten, you know, it might be cute and fun, but when they get to be a big cat, that's not fun or cute anymore. So I, I don't encourage biting at all. And again, it's, it's not playing with hands. I want to encourage, I want to redirect that and encourage them to bite toys, not hands. So that's the main way. Um, Leo actually, like I mentioned, he was on bike quarantine. So once the behavior department had worked with him and then he went up for adoption, and he was still very shy, but we felt that he was probably getting close to being ready. Well, on his first meet and greet, sadly, he had a scary encounter and he bit the person. I'm finding that 
he likes to play. So when I have him on my lap, he will turn around and grab me and bite me and, you know, try to disembowel my wrist with his back legs. And I simply make sure that every time I'm interacting with him, I have a wand toy next to me. So if he starts to do that, I just pull the wand toy a little bit away from me and redirect that biting to the wand toy. Now you've also got to be careful that we're not rewarding the bite with play, which means you got to play a lot because if you, if you don't play enough, then they go, well, I know how to get her to play with me. I'm going to bite her. And then she's going to pull out that wand toy and we're going to have a great play play session. So yeah. be sure to play with them enough so that they're not starved for play all the time. Remember, it's something that's very natural to them. In the wild, they'll spend six hours a day hunting. So when we keep them in captivity, we need to, you know, we need to do that a lot. I would not saying you have to pray play six hours a day, of course, but, but a lot. And that's why I say three to four times is absolute minimum, more if possible. And, and so is, is uh, pray play how you address the, the issue of, of creating bite inhibition, especially with your, your singletons, I imagine? Yes, redirecting that bite. It's very important to redirect it. Like I said, I don't I don't condone hissing at them or scaring them or making them any kind of negative reinforcement is, is not effective at all. Keep it all with positive reinforcement. So give them treats, give them love when they're being really good. And when they're biting you, put them down and move away because they need to learn that biting you it means no interaction. Don't, don't try to scold them or boop them on the nose or anything like that. So redirect it and ignore. Ignoring is very big for cats because, you know, it, at the end of the day, cats are, are narcissists, right? <laughs> the definition of a narcissist is they're having an excessive need for admiration, right? You know, they, they always want to kind of be the center of attention when they want to be, and then they want to be, they want to be in complete control of their environment and everything. Disregard for others' feelings, right? Because cats are all about what's in it for me. You know, they can't handle criticism, which is really true about cats. They don't do well when you try to punish them for things. They do very well if you show them this, not that. I always say you can't say no to a cat. You have to show it what you want it to do instead. And then a final, you know, characteristic of being a, a narcissist is, is a sense of entitlement, which of course, I think we can all say um, cats probably share. <laughs> it's a sense of entitlement. <laughs> it's true. It's true. All right. So, so thinking about, you know, this is kind of the same, well, thinking oral things, right? So we've got the biting type cats. Um, and then Mara has a question um, about suckling. Um, so he, he's a socialized kitten. Um, sounds like they've got a, a bit of a suckling on their clothing issue. What do you think? Yeah, well, suckling is a, is, can be a natural thing for kittens. I mean, it, it soothes them. So they're mimicking nursing on their mom, usually combined with suckling. You'll see kneading and purring, and that's what they were doing when they were nursing from mom. We, you know, there's, there's not a lot of scientific data out there about why they do it. It's assumed that they, they do it if they're weaned too young, that they'll, they'll suckle. Um, and they usually suckle, they call it wool sucking also. So they'll suckle soft blankets and things. It's not something that I usually tell people to try to change a behavior. Not all cats do it and it's bringing them comfort. So, you know, provide them something to suckle on that you're okay with. You know, if you don't want them suckling on your robe or something like that, then give them, I have a, a little woolly lamb toy, although Pico doesn't suckle, it would be ideal for a suckling. It looks like a dog toy, actually. It's kind of on the big side and it's woolly and nubby and, and that would be good. So provide them something um, to suckle on and I would say, don't worry about it. It's just not harmful. It's not harming the cat and, and it's as long as it's not, as long as it doesn't advance or progress into pica, which is eating things or, you know, actually chewing through and, and ingesting things, then I don't, I don't consider it a, a behavior you should worry too much about. Great. All right. So we do have another question. So this is a classic kitten behavior here. 
uh, loud at night. What are your thoughts on, on working to keep kittens quiet at night? Yeah, so that's a good one. That's a very good one. If you follow a good feeding schedule, you shouldn't have that issue. So most kittens get loud at night because they're hungry. This applies to kittens and cats. In the wild, they're gonna eat 10 to 20 small meals a day. So when we hold them in captivity and we only feed them two or three times a day, that's like us eating every second or third day. So that's why I recommend you feed very, very frequently, four to six times if it's a really, tiny kitten, feed them six times a day. So right after you get up, 20 minutes or so after you get up, and then you know about three to four hours periods, and then get a timer, get a food timer. I have a resource link on my site. If you go under the resource page, food and nutrition, there's a product link to one on Amazon that's very inexpensive. And so set it to go off at about 3 a.m. Comes with an ice pack, so you can put some of the wet kitten food in there and have it go off at 3 a.m. That starts that cycle again of eat, groom, sleep. So then it'll go back to sleep until you can get up. Um, you can also be sure to leave, you know, like I said, music on for them. The, um, the radio for cats on Pandora has cats purring in the background and things like that, which does tend to calm them down and also make them sleep better through the night. But asking a cat to go eight hours without a meal while we sleep, it's a, that's a long span and not all of them uh, do that. So the feeding schedule and then lots of prey play will burn off that energy so that they're not as dialed up at nighttime. Right, right. So we've got a couple of questions about um, the, it sound, sounds like phase one. Do you mind going back to that slide and just going, going through that? Yeah. Um, and then specifically uh, thinking, what if you have a group of kittens um, that are in different phases um, and, and how you would potentially address that? Mm -hmm. If you have kittens, let me get back up here. Sorry, all the way back. Here we there go. We go. Um, so Phase one is really, if you have multiple kittens, so I'm not sure, you know, are they all in the same room? Are they, they should be separate. So if you're bringing a kitten in as a new foster, don't put it in with your other kittens unless you have one other or you're fostering a pair together is the best thing that are in the same situation. But your new kitten should be in, in their environment by themselves not mixed in with your other kittens. So you're gonna get through phase one pretty quickly, I would hope that you'll move through phase one pretty quickly while they're in their contained environment. So I'd say keep them in their contained environment until they hit phase three, and then you're gonna let them out in the room with the other kittens, and then everybody should be pretty much on the same page. And again, remember, they're gonna learn from observing one another. So once you let them out into the environment with the other kittens and they see them interacting with you, they will get an idea that that's a safe activity. Right, right. All right, so, you know, we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, so we do have a number of additional questions, and I guess, um, you know, so we've run out of time, but I do really want to want to recommend um, Molly's uh, website, Cat Behavior Solutions. It's It's got a ton of great resources answering a bunch of these questions. And then specifically the Cat Talk Radio, I personally love the reducing stress in the shelter episode, um, as well as, um, you know, she, Molly, you just published these uh, listeners' questions episodes, and they're, they're really great, too. So I, I, I'm thinking that also will be a great resource for people. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, and we're getting ready to do another listener question segment, so that'll be a, a good one, too. All righty. Well, and and I'd say also, sorry, Quincy, but if there are questions we didn't answer, if you feel free to email me as well. So it's molly at catbehaviorsolutions.org. I'm happy to follow up by email anything we didn't get to today. Great, great. Well, thank you. And I, and I just want to say thank you to everyone who uh, joined us today um, and to all of our fosters. I know we had um, people from across the country and really, you know, shelters around the country really rely 
on what you do. So thank you all and thank you for taking the time uh, to do a little uh, you know, Sunday afternoon webinar time. Um, I will be sending out an email with um, resources for you to check out. So Molly's website, our website. Um, but yeah, we really encourage you to, to look into um, all of the all of the great free resources Molly offers, um, and then also uh, you know the Santa Fe Animal Shelter. We're really trying to do more of these community classes, so check out um, what we have coming up. Uh, and yeah, we're really hoping to get more cat things. And yeah, I'm lucky to have Molly to help us on that way. So we're looking to see probably the next one will be adult cats, but we also have a great lineup of uh, dog options already up there. So check that out. Um, and yeah, thank you again for joining us. And if you would like to consider donating, that would be great. These are free resources that we're able to bring due to generous donations. So both uh, the shelter and the Molly and Molly, we thank you. Right. <laughs> yes, thank you, everyone. Alrighty. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.